Yes, it's uh, our next speaker. Um, mm -hmm. His name is William Bennett, and I'm I'm excited to announce that he is our next speaker because I am considering to have him as like one of my great friends. Uh, he is a TU alum, and I worked with him for various projects at TU. And um, there's nothing. I mean, there's 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 nothing wrong. You can go. You can't go wrong with William Bennett. Like uh, he's mm -hmm. able to. Um, he's one of the hardest workers I've ever worked with. I worked with uh, the Global Game Jam with him, and uh, he is a natural leader whenever it comes to just working in video games and just the game design in general. Um, and he he had a, so he was a TU alum with uh, degrees in computer science, computer simulation, and gaming, and he is currently pursuing a master's of interactive technology and programming specialization, uh, the SMU Guild Hall. Um, so cool. just get, give a round of applause for William Bennett and uh, let him take the floor. So um, my project, or I've done a project um, about geometric based reverberation. Um, and under the assumption that everybody can hear me. Um, so I did dynamic, dynamic geometric based reverb. So um, starting out a little bit about me, um, like they just said is, so I'm from Oklahoma. Um, I'm an alumni from the University of Tulsa with degrees in computer science and computer simulation and gaming. Um, and I have minors in math and art. Um, so, and so I'm currently pursuing my master's. Um, great. Um, so I'm pursuing my master's um, from the SMU Guildhall, um, Master's of Interactive Technology in Digital Game Development. Um, that's a mouthful, um, but my specialization is in programming. So here's a little bit of an agenda of everything I'm gonna go over. Um, there's some high level stuff, there's some low level stuff. Um, I'll let you know when we start getting to low level stuff because I'm still learning to like describe them and I need to figure that out anyway. Um, so starting out for an overview. So the motivation and inspiration for this project. Um, so graphics has really taken the forefront in innovation in recent years with um, the ray tracing and the different types of materials that, have, um, that you can do. Um, and the resource budget for audio is actually very small. Um, they kind of get a skip with whatever's left. So for this project, I wanted to see what would happen if we apply graphics effects to audio. Um, and disclaimer, this is also my thesis project, so another motivation for, you know, for doing it. So the goal um, for my project is ray trace reverb. Um, and to be able to replicate the real world, real world effect of reverb um, dynamically. Um, and I'll get into what that means a little bit later on. So some previous work that's actually been done in this. Field. So from Microsoft, you have Project Titan. It's a wave-based approach. Um, but it provides multiple things, such as occlusion, which is sound leaking through walls, which is shown in the top picture, um, and obstruction, which is there's something in the way, like the um, bottom picture, um, as well as reverberation, which is what I will be covering. Um, and Call of Duty Modern Warfare, they have something called a re weapon reflection system, where when guns are fired, they have the correct effect for the next to a building, kind of subway tunnel. Um, I believe they also said, like, if you're in front of a car. Um, and they also use ray tracing to kind of sense the size of the room and they play sounds at different points to kind of make sure that you are more immersed in their own world. So a little bit of background. So we'll start with reverb. So it's short for reverberation um, and it's just a collection of sound waves. So like echoes, but they're really close together and you don't really get the echo. Like you don't hear them usually more than once like you would with echo. Um, it's based on some factors so such as volume and geometry of the room. So not only the layout of the room, but also anything that is in the room itself, as well as absorption and scattering factors. So what this is, is different materials absorb a certain amount of energy. Um, they also scatter energy a bit differently. Um, and so kind of what reverb sounds like is here's the original sound. And here's that sound with reverb applied. Um, and so you can tell that like the second piano sounds like it is in a um, fairly large room or at least one that reflects a lot of sound. Um, and that sound I will be getting back to you later and it might sound a little bit repetitive. 
Um, but I think it's important so that you actually understand kind of the differences between different rooms. So some common techniques for um, reverb is algorithmic. So it can sound really realistic. Um, you have customized parameters such as the delay. So how um, far do you want it to like sound like coming back to you? The size of the room, density of the room, which is just how much reverb is actually applied and frequency filtering to name a few. Um, but it can be more expensive to perform. Um, so the more realistic you want it to sound, the more expensive it also is. Um, and pre-recorded impulse responses, otherwise known as IRs. Um, so they're recorded in a real place. So they capture all the scattering, all the material absorptions, the size of the room. Um, one of the drawbacks though, is that it requires equipment to be taken to location. Um, and like what I'm gonna be doing, it uses convolution and what kind of reasons of that here? Okay, so what is an impulse response? So this is part of, this is a big part of what I need to figure out. Um, so it's just the reaction of a dynamic system to an external change. Um, and this is actually what's responsible for how much reverb is added to a signal. Um, so this graph right here shows what a pre-recorded impulse response. I believe this one was in a tunnel. Um, and so this is kind of what an impulse response typically looks like when it's recorded in a real place. So there was a lot of setup that went into this. So this was done in my own personal C++ game engine. Um, part of the Guildhall curriculum for programmers is you create your own game engine from the ground up. Um, physics engine, your own math library, graphics engine. Um, and they don't really put a lot of emphasis on the audio side. Um, so an audio engine. So my original audio engine was from F1. It was just kind of given to me and I tweaked it a little bit, but I wanted to do something that I had a lot more control over. Um, so C++ API was important. So I chose XIU2. So it's a low level, low latency, high performance um, audio engine that, can, that was made for game developers. Um, and it allows me to have access to an audio processing graph, which it allows the creation of voices, which is where the sounds are played um, and effects that can be attached to those voices. Um, and then I also needed 3D sources. So X3D audio, it's an extension to X audio 2. Um, it allows staff listeners and emitters, and emitters. So listeners, they listen to the sound and emitters emit the sound. Um, and digital signal processing functions. So this is where our audio effects come in. Um, this was really important to have so that I could um, define my own audio effects. Um, Microsoft defines it as cross-platform audio processing objects or X APIs. So this is everything that the audio engine that I created entails. Um, and it kind of needed to be set up um, before I could start on a lot of the project. Um, and it also only reads in WAV files currently. So ray tracing. So this is a ray tracing um, effect. So I needed a couple of different things. So ray versus sphere. Um, so spheres are used to represent audio sources or listeners. Um, and the reason we use spheres is because audio will play at a point whenever you're putting it inside a video game or something. And the odds of a ray hitting a point perfectly um, is, is nearly impossible. So we kind of use spheres to give it volume um, so that we can actually collect um, data. So, and then ray versus a voxel grid. So the world geometry is made up of one by one by one blocks in a grid pattern. And there's an algorithm that exists that computes this ray versus the grid really fast. And so yeah, that's why I went with um, that algorithm and why it's not just um, randomly or so everything is in a grid shape to make it a little bit easier. So when the ray hits one of the walls, floors, or ceilings, it reflects. And so when it reflects, we increment the number of bounces we multiply an absorption factor of um, based on the material. Um, so if the starting energy is one and something has an absorption factor of 5%, um, we do one minus the 5% to reflect 95% of the energy back into the system. Um, and we add the length of that ray to the total path, path length that we've been keeping track of so that it can be used um, later on. So when the ray hits the spheres, we actually take down the number of bounces, the current absorption coefficient, and the ray length plus the total path length. Um, and this is what we actually use later on um, to compute the impulse 
response. So compute shaders. So for more accurate simulations, the more rays you trace, the better. Um, and since this is the only intensive thing that I am doing in the project, um, I currently have over 4 million rays that are being traced, um, which sounds like a lot, but most of them likely won't hit the target. And that's because when you do rays, um, they could barely miss the target, even though you would know, you would think that it would hit it. Um, and so by just adding more rays, um, you just increase the accuracy because they actually hit. Um, and the reason for compute shaders, so is because the GPU can actually be utilized for extra computation power. Um, and this really works well if whatever you're doing can be parallelized. So with 4 million rays, I, those can be parallelized um, into 4 million threads on the GPU. Um, the GPU doesn't have 4 million threads, so it kind of puts them in a job process. Um, and as part of the programmable shader pipeline in DirectX 11, and since I already have a uh, graphics engine in DirectX 11, it was just simply adding it in. So something that's super important, in an ideal situation with unlimited compute power, we could trace the rays from each audio source to the listener, and that's known as forward propagation. Um, unfortunately, this isn't an ideal situation. So we're performing the reverse. Um, so backwards propagation. So we're tracing the rays from the listener to each of the audio sources. Um, this allows the ability to capture the impulse response at multiple locations, um, the audio sources themselves, um, instead of just doing one at a time. And so it speeds it up and also um, justifies also having 4 million rays because now we're not just doing it against one audio source, but against multiple. And so we come to the fast Fourier transform and it's inverse, so known as FFT and IFFT. Um, so FFT is used to transform signal from the time domain to the frequency domain. Um, and this inverse just turns it back to the time domain. And this works best when the signal has a has length of a power of two. Um, so this was important because when we compute the impulse response, and I'll get into that later on, it's in the time domain. So on the left, it has um, it's over time, it has an amplitude. And the frequency domain on the right, um, we utilize something from, for a convolution called the circular convolution theorem, and we put it in frequency space. So up to here has all just been set up for me to get into the main thing, which is convolution, and then the actual impulse response generation. So convolution. So this is where I'm going to start getting a little bit low level into the actual math. Um, because it, this is one of the two big things that I've had to um, implement. So convolution, it's an operation that uses two functions to actually compute a third function. Um, in DSP, we can use convolution to actually map an impulse response to an audio signal. And you um, heard that a little bit earlier whenever I played the two sounds. Um, so the kind of convolution it's used is known as a street convolution. So it's um, just a specific type. And there are methods to compute this reconvolution, and we use overlap add. Um, and it's specifically used when one signal is significantly longer than the other. So X audio 2 and to their DSP function gives 480 samples every frame. And we can think of that every frame as being of an infinite length. But the impulse response, um, it's not going to really change length. Um, so we can call that a finite. So the discrete convolution itself is the operation on two signals of infinite length. Um, so, the, but there's really only two cases that we use discrete convolution for, which is both signals have a finite length, and this is what's done in offline audio processing, such as Adobe Audition. Um, the reverb I showed you earlier was um, in Adobe Audition, and as soon as I finish up with comp with the convolution, I'll actually show the difference between um, offline processing versus um, real-time processing. So when one signal is infinitely long while the other is finite, um, that's called running convolution. Um, it's used for real-time filtering, and this is the type that I am actually using. Um, so the typical case, infinite stream of incoming input signals with a finite impulse response. Um, that sounds very similar to um, what I just said I was using overlap add for. OK, so here um, we have our original signal x of n. And we break it down into windows, and then we zero pad it. So in this case, our windows are of size two, but we zero pad to the next, um, so where we can zero pad it and have some overlap for later. Um, 
And so then we have this in all these windows of the original audio signal. And so when it says IDFT and DFT in, down in this bottom picture, that's just um, the D stands for discrete Fourier transform instead of fast Fourier transform. Um, but we're using FFT to do the DFT. So because of circular convolution, we can multiply two signals and frequency space together and then perform the inverse fast Fourier transform to get back in the time domain. Um, and so that's actually what is being shown down here. Um, our impulse response is right here. So we zero pad it also to be of the size of the window. So in this case, the impulse response was size three and we zero pad it to be size four. Um, and so we perform um, the fast Fourier transform on both of the signals and then we multiply them together down here. And then when you perform the inverse, it puts it back in the time domain. So this is the first part of the uh, overlap add method. So just computing the different um, windows. And so once we have done all the computing with um, putting it in the domain frequency space and then bringing it back to time space, uh, we can overlap. So this is where the overlap and add comes in. So we overlap where we did our zero padding before. And um, we just add all of those together um, based on where the zero started in the previous um, signal. And so all these numbers right here are just examples of how to actually compute um, the overlap add method. Um, and so that's how you actually do the overlap add method. So we get into the overlap cache. So X audio two, gives me 480, so it's expecting 480 samples back. So we have a bunch of extra. So what we do is we take this cache that we have from the previous frame, and we just add it starting at sample zero to the end of the cache um, to the new um, overlap add that's already been computed. Um, so then we can output the first 480 samples of that, and we cache the remaining stuff. And we just kind of repeat this every time. And so if in the case, of the diagram on the right, we have um, five frames worth of data. We can output the first frame to um, X audio two and keep the other four. And so we can kind of cycle the data through so that we get, um, so we keep the data from previous frames to get the convolution effect. So part of the issue that we have is with infinite data coming in with a long impulse response, we're losing some information because we're only, currently using the first 512 samples of the impulse response. Um, so with the way I'm doing the overlap add, all my windows are of size 1,024. So that's where uniform block partition comes in. So we saved the last few frames of the input signal. So we cycled those out every time we get a new frame and the first few frames of the impulse response. Um, so since the impulse response doesn't change, we already know what those are gonna be every single time. And so we can actually go ahead and um, do FFT on them to get them in the frequency space. So those frames are called blocks and they're all the same size. In my case, they are all size 1024. Um, so we still perform overlap add, but we can treat each block as a window. So before um, we had one impulse response that we were affecting the entire signal with, but now we have um, a set of blocks of impulse responses. And so we have, we can coordinate each block from the input and the output, or from the input and the impulse response. Um, and so this actually allows more information to be captured and reflected in the output. So um, we can get more of the impulse response so it affects more of the sound. So this impulse response right here is the one that I, I um, use to test. So um, we have the original sound that I'm about to play, convolution done in audition, and then convolution that was done in action. So audition um, seemed like it was a little more um, rich and it, you could tell that it was more of a reflection and that's just because audition has access to the entire impulse response and I'm only using um, the six first frames of 512. Um, so it sounds a little bit more accurate, 
Um, and that's just because of um, how much of the actual impulse response I'm able to use. So then we move on to the impulse gener response generation. Um, and so this was the second big part that I needed to tackle um, so that um, I could generate these things and get the effect myself without having to record um, in an actual location. So we have the direct sound. So it's the direct unblocked path from the listener to the source. Um, early reflections, also known as specular reflections. Um, and these are the sound rays that bounce perfectly off of an object. Um, and then we have late reflections. So they're also called diffuse reflections. And these are reflections that are typically spawned when sound hits an object and is scattered. Um, so these aren't perfect bounces, they just kind of bounce um, randomly. So for the purpose of my simulation and model, we're not calculating those because for every bounce, you have to have a, a number of rays are produced and that would increase exponentially. So I have 4 million rays in my um, simulation and they each bounce 30 times. So 4 million times 30 is already 120 million rays that are being produced. So that would increase very fast to the billions. Um, and we don't have infinite comp compute power. So where do we get our impulses? So that's from our ray tracing that I talked about earlier. Um, so once we have all of our impulses, they still need to be placed at the correct time or correct places in time. Um, and so this formula right here is um, actually how I would place all my impulses. So you have your impulse, which is um, this delta function. Um, and the index of that is actually delay. So the delay is calculated based on the, the length of the um, ray that was traced for it, um, divided by the speed of sound, multiplied by the sample rate. So in this case, it's um, the path length divided by 343 meters per second. Um, yeah, times 44,100, because that's the sample rate I'm using. Um, so you multiply the function delayed by that amount by the energy that's in, that you have recorded at the system. So this is the absorption coefficient comes in. And because we want to put things in phase, so positive or negative, um, we multiply negative one to the number of to the power of the number of bounces. So this will tell us whether that specific impulse was positive or negative. And this also allows impulses to cancel each other out. Um, so this is a generated impulse response that I generated myself. So something to know about the impulse response um, is it's solely based on the listener's position and the geometry of the room. And it has nothing to do with whatever audio is actually playing. It's applied to the audio. So their impulse response in the audio itself is separate, but I compute it based on the position of the source. Um, so we have my generated impulse response along with my pre-recorded impulse response. So they look very similar, with the difference really being that the pre-recorded um, is a lot longer, that's seconds long, I believe mine is milliseconds long. And um, it has more samples because it's able to capture a lot more because of sound how, how sound reacts in real life. Um, so I have some demo set up. So the sound might get a little repetitive, but it'll really um, highlight the differences. So we have a highly reflective room. So very little sound is absorbed. And that's actually only 2%, which means 98% is reflected back. So I also tried to replicate a living room. So with drywall, it absorbs 5% of the energy and carpet, which absorbs 45% of the energy. And then also a completely sound padded room, which absorbs about 80% of the energy. So starting with the highly reflective room, um, for the, I also have some without um, obstacles or with, with obstacles. So these are the ones without. Um, and so I'm just going to play them all four together so you can kind of see that being at different locations um, provides different um, impulses. <laughs> 
So right there, like four different positions, they all, every um, surface has the same um, absorption coefficient. And so you can actually hear like it starts to get, or it has a lot of reverb to it. Um, so when we move to the living room and after I do the three, I'm gonna have comparisons between each spot and the different rooms. So you could hear kind of like the differences between each room as well. So for the living room with carpet having absorbing a lot of sound, So that last one was significantly um, quieter because it's also farther away and a lot more of the sounds being absorbed versus the third one where I'm actually really close to it and it's, um, you're, it's picking up a whole lot more. So in a completely sound padded room, um, the first and fourth positions actually were not audible at all because of how much of the sound was actually absorbed. Um, but the other two spots, So what the third one shows is that I'm still close enough to the sound that I get enough direct sound and enough rays actually um, hitting the sphere that I still get a virtually pure sound and there's not a lot of reverb um, versus the second one where a lot of the sound is also absorbed there and um, it's significantly quieter. So now I'm going to compare the different locations or the same location, but in each of the different rooms with the different materials. So the first one compared to the second one, um, there's the first one has a lot more reverb applied to it than the second one does. Um, and the second one, sounds more like you would expect from a living room. Um, and of course, the sound padded room wasn't audible from this location. So the spot two where this is like directly in front of it, but it's um, not next to a wall, it's just kind of in the middle of the room. So here being in the center of the room, you can tell that there's a definite difference um, that a lot of the sound is actually reflected. Um, so the first one has a lot of reverb. The second one that, that I call the living room has less reverb. And the third one has virtually no reverb and is very, um, is much quieter than the other two. So spot three, so this is right next to a wall that's also right next to the source. So once again, you can really tell the difference between the amount of reverb um, that's applied in each of the different rooms uh, because the sound padded room has virtually no reverb. The living room has little, um, and then the highly reflective space has a lot of reverb. Um, and so this is from the farthest point in the room from the source. Um, so getting into that. So yeah, I think that this just outlines that being farther away um, in the highly reflective room, you do hear a lot more. It is quieter because of how far away you are, but you do hear a lot more of the um, reverb than you do in the living room, um, but you can still hear the sound. And of course, in the sound padded room, I couldn't hear anything from it. So now we have a highly reflective room with obstacles. So it's great that I have a completely empty room, um, but some obstacles. So everything in here is still highly reflective. So in the first um, one, it's kind of like behind this wall where the arrow is. And the third one is directly behind the wall. And in the fourth one, it's directly behind the wall where the arrow is also pointed. Um, it's kind of weird. And I didn't um, think to put any maps to actually show what the uh, geometry was. But so going through these. <laughs> 
Um, so, um, so this doesn't do obstruction, but even even though it doesn't do obstruct or obstruction or occlusion, a lot of um, you can you still get the effect of something being in the way here. So at a living room with obstacles, so with the obstacles, um, the first one was not audible, um, but the second one being right next to it, um, the third one, it's right around that corner. And then the fourth one is in the same place as the last one, it's kind of behind a wall as well. So uh, a lot of the sound in the living room with obstacles is absorbed and um, not as much actually, not as much energy reaches to the audio source itself. So some drawbacks. So impulse response generation um, currently cannot be done in real time. Um, so there's a cycle that freezes the simulation when you generate a new impulse response. Um, and that's because it takes about three seconds currently to run the calculations in the compute shader and then put them in the correct places on the CPU. Um, and that's a long time to wait for anything inside of a game. Um, so when performing the convolution in real time, and that is done in real time, any slight delay that affects the program actually distorts the results. And it sounds really, really bad and I actually have to restart the program. Um, so by like any slight delay, it could, be turning up the volume um, using my FN and volume up key. Um, so it's very sensitive. Um, so what are some applications? So this all sounds really cool. Um, so one of the first things you can do is you can save the impulse response. So I have added the ability to actually output wave files. Um, and one instance is inside games, you've got trigger volumes um, that when you trigger them, they set off, they are set to use a different set of impulse responses on the different audio sources. Um, so this kind of takes away the drawback of um, only being able to do up to so many sources at a time because of how computationally expensive it is and makes it so that you can compute it one at a time if you want and save them off um, and have them at different locations. Um, and you can also do something similar to using light probes that bake light into the scene. Um, you can use the same technique as light probes for impulse responses and just fade between them. Um, and so this could actually be, um, and this actually is what reflects Microsoft's project Titan, even though it's wave, wave based, um, saving things off so that they can be sampled later on um, during runtime is actually something that's used quite often. Um, so you can also see how different spaces and materials affect sounds quickly. Um, so like it's kind of just dropping in uh, to a world that you create and um, just seeing how it sounds. Um, so with the implementation to handle complex objects, um, you can see how the placement of an object affects sounds. Um, the absorption coefficient related to that object, if it absorbs a whole lot of energy, it's going to um, change how it sounds a lot. Um, and it allows for more accurate sounding scenarios in a game. So firefights like Call of Duty, um, racing games, so like going through a tunnel, horror games. Um, I think that one just kind of explains itself. I think it'd be really creepy to like hear something that I know is right behind me just based on um, reverberation and things like that. So future work, so short term within the next week. Um, and I say within the next week because my thesis is very quickly becoming due. Um, I do need to handle multiple audio sources and be able to test them out inside um, in game. Um, so more long term work that I won't be doing currently. So ray versus convex objects. Um, so you can have more interesting geometry. Um, consider other elements such as occlusion and obstruction. So looking into it, um, occlusion and obstruction is either messing with the volume of the sound or um, using another type of filter called a low pass filter. Um, diffuse reflections, the scattered sounds. Um, so there are ways to get around having to output a bunch of um, sounds or having to um, do the exponential raise. Um, so there are a few ways to get around that. Um, and optimizations. So 
there can always be optimizations done to make it faster. And eventually, I think it could actually be done in real time. So conclusion before I get to questions. Um, so giving audio a budget similar to graphics allows for really cool effects to be done, such as um, reverb. Um, and some things I learned throughout the project. So if you think you have something right from the beginning, you most definitely don't. Um, in the last two months alone, I realized multiple times that both my convolution and impulse response generation were wildly off. Um, and they, the, I thought those were right since October. Um, and they were not. Um, and do enough research. So I started this project with little knowledge at all about audio programming. Because like I said, Guildhall doesn't really focus on the audio programming aspect. Um, and so it made it very difficult in the beginning because I didn't have to do enough research. Um, so that is also why my convolution and impulse response generation were off. Um, but with that, that is my presentation. So I can get to questions now. All right, we want to thank you for joining us today at CSGC 2021. And uh, we'll jump into it because there's uh, quite a few questions. The first question is, can you explain the zero padding or define it? Yes, uh, I'll go back up here to kind of explain it. So for the overlap add method to actually work well, um, it needs to be of size n, but that n needs to be um, a power of two. So in the case of the example here, it's a it is a power of two, um, but we need the window size to be two in um, so that we can actually overlap. Um, so with it being a power of two in, we get all the zeros we need so that we can actually perform overlap because what um, circular, com what do doing the fast Fourier transform does um, is it rotates the signal around itself. Um, and so you get repeat signals um, at the end where um, the zero padding takes place. Um, and so we zero pad it two inch so that we can overlap and get correct results. Let me do that again. All right. The next question. Why do so few of the rays traced actually hit the target? Is there a way to make them more efficient? So the reason so few rays actually hit the target is because rays are infinitely small um, lines through the space. And so you could miss the target by um, like a millimeter, but it wouldn't detect it. Um, and so that's why a lot of, why many of them don't hit at all. Um, and a way to make them more efficient is um, you can use other aspects of that use ray tracing, such as beam tracing. Um, and so that just sends out a beam and it, it hits or it gets more accurate results, but I think it is also more, um, more efficient just to use pure ray tracing and just send out more rays. All right, and this may be in tandem with the last question. It says, this seems really cutting edge. Has a lot of work been done in this area? So it seems like a lot of this work had been done years ago, um, but the sh shift was really towards graphics. Um, and so and a lot of um, implementations don't use pure ray tracing like I am. Um, they're, they have algorithms that can actually compute the tail of reverberation. Um, and I don't really do that. Mine is completely ray tracing. So um, it's definitely not been done a lot at all. The next one is how hard is this to use to replicate outdoor settings? Um, I tried it a little bit. You definitely get less reverb. Um, with outdoor settings, it's a little bit harder for me at the moment because of how I have the uh, have it all set up. Um, to like do tall buildings or anything like that. Uh, so there hasn't, I haven't done a lot of testing, but you do get a little bit of reverb if you have like a room and with no ceiling. 
All right, the next question is, if you have an obstacle, do you take into account the differences in the speed of sound within the obstacle material, or does it make too little difference? Um, so I do not take that into account currently. Um, if I were to get into occlusion, I would, um, I would take that more into account and start looking into act how to do that effectively so that I can make sure that everything else stays at the same speed as well as like when it leaves the object. So currently I don't take that into account. All right, our next question. So would it be accurate to compare ray tracing in this application to echolocation? Um, I had not thought of that before, but thinking about it, how I just kind of send out rays to hit the source, um, I think it actually probably could be. And our last question, do you plan to implement this in an open source engine for others to use? I would love to do that. Um, so I have a friend who really likes audio programming, who I've talked to them about this a lot, and they are super excited about it. Um, current plans, no. Um, if there is enough interest, I actually could look into it, kind of seeing where I would do it. Um, Currently, my knowledge about doing ray tracing versus um, various objects or how to make it more efficient is lacking a lot. Um, so current plans, no, but I possibly could in the future. All right. Well, thank you again. It's always good to have an alumni come to our events, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your weekend to join us for CSGC 2021. Thank you for having me.